Hello everyone and welcome to our chapter 28 lecture which will cover the reproductive system. Specifically this screencast will discuss the anatomy of the female reproductive system as well as the physiology of the female reproductive system. So let's start out with the anatomy first. We have the ovaries, which are going to be our female gonads. Their job is to promote a gamete, which would be an egg or a oocyte or ova. And they also secrete the female sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone. We also have some accessory ducts that will include our uterine tubes, which are also called fallopian tubes also known as oviducts so three different names uterine tubes fallopian tubes and oviduct and we also have the uterus and the vagina some external genitalia will be a part of our female reproductive system as well and we will see that in a couple coming slides so this is a sagittal view of the female reproductive system we could see the symphysis pupus is over here posterior to that we have our urinary bladder with the urethra and then if we look posterior to the urethra we see another canal and this canal belongs to the vagina if we move superiorly we could see the cervix of our uterus and our body of the uterus extending laterally we only see this on the the one side here on the right side we see the fallopian tube or the uterine tube and over here this tan like structure is your ovary this is just a ligament that we will discuss in a moment moving back inferiorly you could see the last canal or opening we will have is the anus and anal canal and the rectum over here. Now, if we look at that external genitalia that we were talking about earlier, we are going to have anteriorly the clitoris and then laterally we see the labia minora surrounded even more laterally by the labia majora. So first let's discuss the ligaments. First, we have the ovarian ligament, and that is the ligament that we just saw in the previous figure. The ovarian ligament is going to anchor our ovary medially to the superior margin of the uterus. So if you didn't figure it out yet, this over here is our uterus. This is the superior aspect. This would be the inferior aspect down in here. We also have the suspensory ligament, which is seen over here in our figure. And this anchors the ovary laterally. So you don't really see it because we have this other broad ligament covering it up. So we attach to the ovary laterally here, and then it anchors it over to the pelvic wall, which we can imagine is in this area here. This is gonna contain the ovarian artery, ovarian veins, and also nerves. Now our next structure, the mesovarium, I'm gonna put a pin in this real quick because first I want to point out to you the broad ligament. The broad ligament is going to be this large structure in here, if you can follow my arrow. Um, it's almost like a draping of tissue over this area. So in order to break it up a little bit, we will discuss the mesovarium, mesocelphinx, and the mesometrium that gets created by this broad ligament. So what does the broad ligament do on its own? It's going to attach the um, fallopian tubes up here, our uterus, and the vagina over to the pelvic wall and it helps to support the suspensory ligament as well as those other ligaments we discussed the mesovarium mesocelphinx and the mesometrium and we'll see pictures of those ligaments in just a moment here's a figure that shows us some of those ligaments and the ovaries we are going to talk about the full anatomy toward the end of this section. So I'm gonna just breeze through these figures and you can come back and take a look at these on your own time. Now let's get into the ovaries. The ovaries have a blood supply from our ovarian artery. Remember that that is cascading on down from the 
abdominal aorta. We called this the gonadal artery, but in a female, we give it the name of ovarian artery. The other way we get blood supply is through this ovarian branch of our uterine artery. So if you follow this maroon line here, you could see here's our uterine artery, and this is the ovarian branch moving on upward to give supply to our ovary. Our ovary's outermost covering is going to be the ovarian or germinal epithelium. Um, basically, this is going to be a visceral peritoneum, and it is surrounded by a fibrous tunica albiginia, which is why it has that white color to it. We do have some poorly defined regions within the ovary. So just as we saw with uh, the kidney and some other organs, the periphery will have a cortex. And the cortex is where we are going to find these ovarian follicles carrying the oocytes or the eggs. And the inner portion will be the medulla. And here we see these openings of very large blood vessels and also some nervous tissue. The stroma will just be the connective tissue of the ovary. So next let's talk about oogenesis. Oogenesis is going to be the production of a secondary oocyte in the ovaries. First, let's discuss the oogonia. Oogonia are going to be almost like the stem cells of our eggs. They are cells from which the oocyte or the egg develops. It begins when you are a fetus and you get the default hormones of becoming a female. And by the time you are about four months, months in the womb, you are going to have about five million oocytes produced. The oogonia, which are our diploid ovarian stem cells, will multiply through mitosis to get to that five million and they will store nutrients. Then we will have about two million of those become primary oocytes and develop in primordial follicles. So here we have a primary oocyte. You'll start to see that we'll get this layer of cells surrounding that oocyte and those are called granulosa cells. Granulosa cells and I have that word coming up in a minute if you want a spelling. Um, those granulosa cells will eventually secrete estrogen, but for the moment they are just going to sit around that oocyte and at that point they uh, will start to grow in number, these granulosa cells, and create multiple layers and the oocyte will enlarge and that's when we get a primary follicle. So before we get to that primary follicle, the primary oocyte in here is going to begin meiosis, but it is going to stop in prophase one. So when you are born, you have all these oocytes, but they are stopped at prophase one. This is just an image of a primordial follicle. Like we said, we have a growing oocyte here, and then they are surrounded by the granulosa cells and then we are going to start to see that they will enlarge and we will be we will have that turn into a primary follicle. So here's what a primary follicle looks like. We have that oocyte in the center and we've got lots of granulosa cells surrounding it. The primary follicle will then turn into a secondary follicle and the secondary follicle will have a lot more granulosa cells surrounding it, but we'll also start to see these little pools called vesicles um, <clears throat> containing fluid that will eventually come together in a much larger pool called an antrum and that's when it will become a graphene follicle. The graphene follicle will then have that fluid push the egg to one side, and eventually we will get an ejection of that egg and begin ovulation. So each month after puberty, a few of the primary oocytes are gonna become activated, and one of them is selected 
to resume meiosis one. So this antrum gets created in our graphene follicle. That egg will be pushed to one side. Also remember that the other cell it divided into, well, I shouldn't call it a cell, but um, the other constituent that it divided into was a polar body. And remember, that's just made up of cytoplasm and will eventually disintegrate. So that fluid pushes to one side. The egg then will be pushed out, and this is ovulation. We will then see our secondary oocyte and a second polar body created. At this point, this oocyte is going to stop in metaphase two. So as it's continuing on, in hopes of meeting a sperm cell so that it can complete meiosis two. So here is a full breakdown of what we discussed. I'm gonna let you read through this process on your own. But we start off here in this primordial follicle, turn into primary follicles, secondary follicle, graphene follicle, that secondary oocyte gets pushed out for ovulation. And then what we're left with is all these granulosa cells here. This is going to create a structure known as corpus luteum. And if we become pregnant at this point, the corpus luteum is going to stay for three months in order for these granulosa cells to secrete estrogen until the placenta can be created by month three. If you do not become pregnant or the egg does not become fertilized, then the corpus luteum turns into the corpus albicans, which is a scar but will degenerate. Here's another figure showing you the process of oogenesis. We see a primary follicle maturing. We are turning into a secondary follicle here. You see all the little pools here called vesicles of fluid. Those vesicles come together and create a large pool called an antrum. And this is now a mature follicle or a graphene follicle. It's not pictured here, but that oocyte gets ejected for ovulation. And then we are left with the corpus luteum, which eventually will turn into the corpus albicans. This is just another figure I threw in here from a physiology textbook. If you like how this one is illustrated more, here are the primordial follicles, which turn into primary follicles into our secondary follicle, into our graphene follicle, ovulation, the corpus luteum, and eventually the corpus albicans. So that brings us to the female duct system. We are going to be discussing the uterine or fallopian tubes, our uterus, as well as the vagina. So beginning with our uterine tubes, this widened portion of the fallopian tube is called the ampulla. And it is this area where fertilization is typically going to take place. And this area would be our distal third of the fallopian tube. If we look even more distally, we're gonna see these finger-like projections here called fimbriae. They are the ones that they almost look like they are massaging the ovary so that the egg can come on over and into the fallopian tube. As this fallopian tube moves in, we're going to see that this region here is called the infidibula and moves in toward the area of the ampulla. Again, at this point, we might have sperm moving through up in this direction to meet the egg for fertilization. Sometimes that egg will get fertilized and won't be able to make it all the way down to the uterus and instead will try to implant on the wall of the fallopian tube and develop in that region. And this would be called an ectopic pregnancy. But let's just say we got that egg fertilized and it's continuing on its merry way. This area where it is more narrow or constricted is called the isthmus. So once we move past the isthmus, we are going to move into the uterus. So before we talk about the uterus, I wanna discuss some more features of our uterine tube. 
our oocyte is being carried, carried along through peristalsis and ciliary action in the fallopian tubes. Our non-ciliated cells are going to nourish that oocyte and the sperm. Now, here we have one of the ligaments that we mentioned earlier. This in yellow is our broad ligament, and you could see as it's draping around the fallopian tube, this is going to be your mesocell sphinx, and it helps to support the uterine tubes and is a part of the broad ligament. Now let's discuss the uterus. Its job is to receive and retain and nourish a fertilized ovum. We have the body, which is the main mass of the uterus in this region. If we draw a line from one fallopian tube over to the other fallopian tube, we see a dome gets created on the superior aspect of the uterus, and that is the fundus. The isthmus is once again going to be a constricted or narrow portion of an organ, so we see it here in the inferior aspect of the uterus, but inferior to the isthmus, we will see the cervix. This is a narrow neck or outlet, and it projects into the vagina. That cervical canal is going to be able to communicate with the vagina through a external os and an internal os. The cervical mucus glands in this region will secrete a mucus in order to block sperm's entry, except during the mid-cycle, during ovulation. At that point, that mucus is going to turn into more of a seromucus, which will allow sperm to move through more easily. So this is a special case here. Rarely, a woman can have a double uterus. And so instead of that uterus just developing as one large uterus, we can have them develop into this double uterus. So you can see here is a normal uterus where we have that full space for a baby to grow. But in a double uterus, there's almost a partition in the middle of that that would allow a baby to implant on this side and another baby to implant on this side. And this is illustrating the two different compartments or the two different uteruses or uteri, I'm not sure how you would say that, um, for babies to implant and grow. And this image here was just showing the different duct systems between males and females. So if in a female, we don't have any signals to secrete testosterone, then we are going to have our paramesonephric duct develop, which will turn into the uterine tube, and we will have our ducts fuse together to form the uterus. And of course, this is at birth, we have our full uterus with the fallopian tubes in our ovaries. But in a male, if we have that testosterone secreted, then that paramesonephric duct is going to degenerate. And instead, we will have our mesonephric duct develop in order to create the vas deferens or the ductus deferens, the epididymis, and have our efferent ductules make communication with the testes. So to finish off the portion of our broad ligament, we have our mesometrium. Anytime you see that metrium term, you want to think uterus. So this is the portion that is going to connect the uterus over to the pelvic wall to give lateral support to the uterus. We also have a lateral cervical or cardinal ligament, and this is attaching from our cervix to the superior portion of the vagina to the walls of the pelvis. We also have a uterosacral ligament attaching the uterus to the sacrum. And lastly, we have our round ligament. And our round ligament is going to connect our uterus over to the anterior pelvic wall. It also is going to travel through our inguinal canal to the labia majora. We have two peritoneal pouches for you to know. These are just going to be sacs of 
peritoneum that exists around the uterus. So just to orientate you real quick, here's our pubic symphysis, our urinary bladder, the uterus, and the rectum posteriorly. So the first pouch we can find between the urinary bladder and the uterus. Vesico refers to our urinary bladder, uterine is referring to our uterus. The other pouch we have is the recto-uterine pouch, and this is formed between the rectum and our uterus. Let's look at the three layers of our uterus. Most external or superficial, we are going to have the perimetrium. The perimetrium is made up of a serous layer, which is your visceral peritoneum. The main mass of the uterus will be your myometrium, myo meaning muscle. So this is smooth muscle that will, of course, contract to push the baby out. And lastly, we have your endometrium, which is a mucosal type of lining, an inner lining to the uterus. And we have two different layers here. We have a functional layer. So I'm going to switch to this slide here in order to discuss this. This is your lumen of the uterus here. And here's our myometrium, our muscle. So our functional layer is going to be the one closest to that lumen or that space where the baby will implant. And this functional layer or stratum functionalis is going to change in response to ovarian hormone cycles. So we'll talk about that toward the end of this lecture. And it's going to shed during menstruation. You can almost think of this functional layer as the shedding of your epidermis because it's going to shed about every 28 to 30 days. And the other layer we have is your basal layer or the stratum basalis. And this helps to have cells go through mitosis in order to form a new functional layer after menstruation. And this is unresponsive to ovarian hormones. So like I said, think of this as your epidermis. So when a woman is having her period, these layers are going to sloth off here. And if you haven't noticed already, look at these spaces here. These are representing arteries and veins. And so as these layers are slothing off, it is also damaging these vessels. And so that's what's causing the bleeding to take place. And once we get all of this functional layer slothed off, that's when the basal layer can rebuild this through days, depending on your cycle, right? But through days, let's say five through 28, it rebuilds that functional layer. And then the woman has her period and the whole cycle happens all over again. Now let's discuss the vagina. This is the birth canal and the organ of copulation. It's going to contain rugae that will help to stimulate the penis during intercourse and will be found between the bladder and the rectum and will extend from the cervix to the exterior environment. The urethra is going to be found more anterior to the vagina and has its own separate opening. If we look at the layers of the wall, we will see a fibroelastic adventitia, pictured down here. We will have a smooth muscle layer and our stratified squamous mucosa with the rugae. In prepubescence, we will see mucosa near the vaginal orifice will form an incomplete partition and this is called the hymen. We also have a vaginal fornix, there's the hymen, and our fornix is going to be the upper end of the vagina and it surrounds the cervix. So here we have the anterior fornix and this would be the posterior fornix. Now let's talk about some external genitalia. If you are looking at this lecture in a coffee shop, now is the time to bring that computer screen closer to you. Um, we'll start off with the mons pubis, and this is going to be this um, fat pad that lies over the pubic symphysis. The labia majora, 
is going to be the outer lips here and this is usually the area that is covered with hair and also contains a lot of fat and will be the structure we found find most lateral to our vulva vulva is just referring to the external genitalia in a female and then we have the vestibule which would be the recess or space between the labia minora and i just realized the labia minora we didn't talk about it is going to be the smaller folds that we see on either side of the vestibule or the opening to the vagina if we follow the labia minora anteriorly, we are going to see the clitoris. You won't see this really externally, um, but we have ducts that will allow secretions from our Bartholin or greater vestibular glands. And this is homologous to the bulbourethral glands. So it really helps to release mucus into the vestibule for lubrication and allow entrance of the penis into the vagina. Like I mentioned earlier, the labia minora folds anteriorly will meet at the clitoris. The clitoris is made up of erectile tissue and it is hooded by a prepuce. Here is the full anatomy of your clitoris. So even though if we're looking with the naked eye, that clitoris is, looks very small, it actually has portions that expand on out. So it too, just like the penis, will have a corpora cavernosa that expands bands at the basis to form the crust of the clitoris and we have a corpora spongiosum as well. We've talked about the peritoneum when it came to the male reproductive system so I just want you to be aware that the female also has the same diamond shaped peritoneum and we use the ischial tuberosities laterally in order to have the lateral points of the diamond, the pubic symphysis anteriorly, and the coccyx posteriorly. So here's the perineum, Whoop. and you could see a lot of the musculature in here as well. We won't be diving into the details as far as the musculature in this region. And here's another illustration showing you the anatomy of the clitoris as well as bulbs of the vestibule and those greater vestibular glands we just discussed. So just quickly wanted to talk about the movement of the sperm cell through the female reproductive system. That sperm gets ejaculated into the vagina the vagina will then move through the cervix and into the uterus. It does not stop there. We have it moved through the fallopian tube. We've got some peristalsis going on here as well to move the sperm over to the ampulla, which is the most common site of fertilization. Now let's discuss the accessory organ here of the female reproductive system, the mammary glands. These are going to be modified sweat glands and we have about 15 to 25 lobes. Um, every woman's breast anatomy is going to be a little bit different. This is why some women say they have no milk supply because maybe they don't have enough lobes in order to produce that milk to uh, fully nourish a baby. Whereas a lot of other women will have so many lobes and be able to produce excessive milk production. We will also have the areola, which will be the pigmented skin surrounding the nipple. And here are some structures uh, that we could see here. The alveolus would be the regions where the milk is going to be produced. That will then move into a ductal and into a main duct. And then we have our lactiferous duct that all of this will drain into, into a lactiferous sinus and eventually out the breast through the nipple pores. The suspensory ligaments of Cooper, or these are also called Cooper ligaments of the breast, are going to attach the breast to the underlying muscle, which we haven't gotten into yet, but this is your pectoralis major muscle that it attaches to. This full structure here, the alveolus, ductal, and duct, 
is going to be known as a lobule with lobes that will contain granular alveoli that produce the milk. So here's our pathway um, in which the milk is produced, moves through those lactiferous ducts that we talked about into the lactiferous sinus and will open to the nipple pore to go to a breast pump or a baby. Also note that the hormone progesterone is going to help stimulate the preparation of the mammillary glands for lactation while she's pregnant. This is just another figure showing you the full anatomy of um, a non-lactating breast versus a lactating breast. So here you could see that those lobules are not full here, whereas in the lactating breast, we take a close-up look at that, and this myoepithelial cell is going to contract to push the milk that the alveoli have created into the ducts to move out through the nipple pores eventually. Next, let's talk about physiology of our female reproductive system. There are going to be two cycles that we'll talk about, the ovarian cycle and the menstruation cycle. So we'll start off with the ovarian cycle, and this is going to be a monthly series of events that are associated with the maturation of an egg. So we will have two consecutive phases um, within a 28-day cycle, and what I like to call an event that takes place in between these phases. So during the follicular phase, we are going to see those follicles developing. So we started from the primordial follicle to a primary follicle to secondary follicle to our graphene or mature follicle. At that point at day 14, we are going to have ovulation take place where that egg is ejected. Then from days 14 to day 28, we will have the luteal phase take place. And this is when we have the leftover granulosa cells turn into the corpus luteum, and eventually that will regress and become the corpus albicans. So I want you to also take note of what's happening with our gonadotrophin hormones here. Our follicle-stimulating hormone, which was first discovered in a female, which is why it's called follicle-stimulating hormone, even though we know that the males also secrete FSH, but they are not stimulating any follicles, but instead stimulating sperm production. So back to what we were talking about here. The FSH, we're going to see higher levels here at the beginning of our ovarian cycle because we need to start stimulating these follicles to develop and enlarge um, and form greater layers of granulosa cells. So then as we start to see that that follicle is maturing, we don't need quite as much FSH. As far as our luteinizing hormone, this stays pretty steady until day 14. On day 14, we are going to get something that is called an LH surge. LH surge. And that is going to determine when this egg will ovulate. So you can go over to your pharmacy and purchase an ovulation test. It's like a pregnancy test. You just pee on that ovulation um, stick and then it measures how much LH you have in your system. If you are experiencing the LH surge, then it is the time that you are ovulating and time to get busy if you want to have a baby. Um, and then after that 14th day, you will see a severe drop in LH and go back to our steady state with um, that hormone release. With our follicle-stimulating hormone, that also will drop, and then you will start to see it on the rise as the body is getting ready to start that ovarian cycle all over again. Of course, you want to make sure to memorize these phases in order because it might be tested. So here's a closer look at the follicular phase. We said that the primordial follicles become primary follicles. Um, we talked about this extensively, so I'm not going to go into too much detail with how um, these follicles are going to develop. One thing I will note, though, is that 
when we have our secondary follicle and late into that secondary follicle phase, we are going to have connective tissue surrounding our follicle and that is going to be a layer of thecal cells and then more internally we have our granulosa cells. We also have a zona pellucida and that you could see pictured here on the right, that yellow band that you see that will form around the oocyte to almost serve as a protective layer and we will start to see that fluid accumulating like we mentioned earlier. Now I don't have a great picture of this but when we do have our uh, late secondary follicle that becomes a vesicular or mature or graphene follicle, when it creates that large antrum here we will see that a little stalk will be created as well and that is going to be called the corona radiata. We said during ovulation that the ovary wall is going to rupture allowing that secondary oocyte along with the corona radiata to be released so it can move into the fallopian tube. When this takes place some women say that they can actually feel when they ovulate. This is called the middle schmerz which is just going to be a twinge of pain when ovulation takes place. It is rare but there is a 1-2% to 2 chance that when a woman ovulates she releases more than one secondary oocyte. So if that is fertilized or both of them are fertilized then that is going to result in fraternal twins. And then with our luteal phase like we said the granulosa cells and the thecal cells are going to be left over to form the corpus luteum and that corpus luteum will stick around for three months if the egg is fertilized in order to um, maintain your hormones until the placenta is properly built at the end of the third month. And if not fertilized, then it becomes the corpus albicans. And if you do not have that egg fertilized, it turns into the corpus albicans within 10 days. And this is just an image of what those structures actually look like. Um, so here is the corpus luteum over here. So we've already talked about the hormone levels when it comes to um, the gonadotrophin secretion. Now I quickly want to take a look at the ovarian hormone secretion in relation to our ovarian events. So estrogen is going to start to increase as we move through the follicular phase. And this is because as our follicle is developing, we are gaining more and more granulosa cells. And the more granulosa cells we have, the greater amount of estrogen that is going to be secreted. Then you see at the area, the time point where we're going to have our ovulation take place, we are getting rid of some of those granulosa cells that will stay along with the egg so that uh, level of estrogen is going to drop because we have less granulosa cells there. Like we said the uh, corpus luteum once fully developed can also secrete estrogen and progesterone so we see these increased levels here when we have that corpus luteum and then if that egg is not fertilized then those levels are going to continue on down. So let's talk a little bit more about our functions of the corpus luteum. It's also going to produce inhibin, which remember will go and tell the anterior pituitary gland to stop secreting FSH. It will also produce progesterone, which I mentioned in the slide earlier. And this little note about these hormones inhibit FSH and LH release is about inhibin and progesterone and estrogen. So you could see that while these hormone levels have increased, these LH and FSH levels are lower. Because at this point we really don't need follicular development and need it to regress until the ovarian cycle takes place again.
This is a nice figure that will tell you about the regulation of hormone secretion during the ovarian cycle. So we see that FSH is being released by the anterior pituitary gland just before ovulation so that we can start to develop those follicles and also secrete estrogen. Estrogen is going to cause our endometrium to proliferate and our hypothalamus to increase the LH secretion, which will result in our LH and FSH surges just before ovulation. When we have our LH surge, the follicle is going to mature and then release that oocyte, and the corpus luteum is going to develop and secrete that progesterone and estrogen that we mentioned in the slide before. At this point, progesterone is going to cause hypertrophy of the endometrium, and we really want that endometrium to be nice, thick, and fluffy so that if the fertilized egg continues on down, it's going to need to implant on that endometrium. So it has this negative feedback effect and will go back up to the hypothalamus to tell it to reduce the amount of secretion of the gonadotrophin releasing hormone and will also go back to the anterior pituitary to tell it to inhibit LH and FSH secretion. Now let's talk about the menstrual cycle or the uterine cycle. These are going to be cyclic changes in the endometrium in response to ovarian hormones. So we have a couple phases here. We've got our menstrual phase that will be between days one and five. In some women, it will be a full week. In other women, it's shorter. It just depends on the person. Um, but on average, days one through five. And then on days six, six through 14, we will have our proliferative or pre-ovulatory phase. And days 15 through 28 will be the secretory or post-ovulatory phase. During the menstrual phase, we're going to see that the ovarian hormones are going to be at their lowest point. Um, this is when the endometrium is shedding and those blood vessels are being torn and allowing the bleeding to take place. But we do start to see that the gonadotrophin hormones are going to start to rise. And that's so that these follicles are going to um, develop. So I just wanted to show you this figure that demonstrates what takes place during menses. We see that functional layer is slothing off and these spiral arteries and veins are being broken, causing the bleeding. Then we start to build up that functional layer and this is kind of late in um, more of the secretory phase where we have that nice fluffy functional layer in our endometrial tissue in order for the baby to implant. Next, let's talk about the proliferative phase here. We see that our estrogen levels are going to prompt generation of new, a new functional layer. So you start to see this nice thickened layer um, of endometrial tissue, and it also increases the synthesis of progesterone receptors in the endometrium, so it can better respond to that hormone. Glands are gonna enlarge, and our spiral arteries are going to increase in number. During our secretory phase, we see that the progesterone levels are going to increase, and this is going to prompt further development of this endometrial tissue, glandular secretion of glycogen, and also formation of a cervical mucus plug. So what happens if fertilization does not occur? Then we'll see that the corpus luteum is going to degenerate. We will have estrogen and progesterone levels fall. Our spiral arteries are going to kink and spasm and break and cause bleeding. And those endometrial cells will die and sloth off. The spiral arteries are going to constrict again, then relax and open wide. We will have those blood fragments weakened and capillary beds and the functional layer will sloth. So what are some of the effects of estrogen? We talked about most of them, but let's talk about it in its entirety. 
It's going to help promote oogenesis and follicle growth in the ovary. It'll exert anabolic effects on the female reproductive tract. It'll support the rapid but short-lived growth spurt at puberty and induce sec secondary sex characteristics. So the growth of breasts, during puberty, we've got increase in deposit of subcutaneous fat that gives women the hips and their breaths and widening and lightening of the pelvis so that they can prepare for childbearing. We also have some metabolic effects where we will maintain low total blood cholesterol and high HDL levels and it'll also facilitate calcium uptake. So keep this in mind for when we talk about menopause at the end. The effects of progesterone we've also talked about, but let's talk about it a bit more. We're going to see that it'll work with estrogen to establish and regulate the uterine cycle, and it'll have effects of placental progesterone during pregnancy. That's going to inhibit uterine motility and will help prepare the breasts for lactation. As far as the female sexual response, it's going to be stimulated by touch and a psychological type of stimuli. The clitoris and the vaginal mucosa and breasts will engorge with blood and our vestibular glands, Bartholin glands are going to have secretions that will lubricate the vestibule of the vagina. The bulbs are gonna fill with blood that will cause the vaginal orifice to narrow. And orgasm is accompanied by muscle tension, increased pulse rate and blood pressure, and rhythmic contractions of the uterus. And no, a female does not have to have an orgasm in order to fertilize that egg. What's interesting about females too is that they don't have a refractory period like males do after orgasm. So they can experience multiple orgasms in a six, single sexual experience. For menopause, all I'm going to mention is that it has occurred when menses has ceased for an entire year. And they say that there's no equivalent to menopause in males, but there is research going on in something that they have termed andropause where we have increased levels of estrogen in males and lower levels of testosterone. So in a female, we see declining estrogen levels. We will start to see that their reproductive organs and breasts will atrophy or um, shrink. They will be irritable and have depression. Um, some will experience anxiety. Um, most women experience hot flashes as skin blood vessels are undergoing intense vasodilation. There will be gradual thinning of the skin and bone loss. Remember we talked about how estrogen also helps with calcium uptake. So because we don't have that calcium component as much, we are going to start to see a reduction in bone density which can lead to osteoporosis. Um, we will also see increased total blood cholesterol levels and falling HDL levels. So that is going to be it for the female reproductive system. Please let me know if you have any questions at all on what we covered.